fasting itself is just going without. And you can choose what you go without. The keto diet is a fast. It's a fast from carbs, right? <laughs> like the vegan diet is a fast from animal food, right? You can do all sorts of different types of things where I'm going to selectively go without something for a period of time. And it is a fast and they have different benefits depending on what you allow and what you don't allow. You can fast from social media. It's a fast, you're going without. And I write about all those different aspects of it in, in fast this way. But let's stick with the other fasting hack for turning off hunger. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Minnie in the house. All right. <laughs> I appreciate that. The carnivore diet. Because of what we eat. Honestly, you've really touched my heart. Here was my big aha when I started to look at your book. You open up the book with you going on a four-day fast in a cave. And... What I didn't understand was, had you fasted prior to that, or did you just get thrown into a cave and started fasting for four days? Because that sounds like the most brutal way to approach fasting. Well, I had done some types of fasting. This is after I had discovered uh, Bulletproof Coffee. And quite often I would do what I now recognize as intermittent fasting, where in the morning, I'm like, I'm just doing this, but I hadn't quite connected the dots. So, oh wait, you do get autophagy. You do get the benefits of fasting, uh, at least many of them, not the identical ones, but most of the benefits of it. Um, so I, I was doing it, but I still uh, didn't have the mindset around fasting uh, that I do now. So we'll say it was, it was the early days and I had never done a four day fast, certainly like a four day water fast. Uh, and I, you know, in, in Peru when I did ayahuasca in the late nineties before, uh, before they thought tourists would ever want to do that. Um, they're like, Dave, you're white. I'm like, yeah, I know. But like, like you're going to throw up. Don't do this. You know, I, I want to try a plant medicine because you know, I, I, there's a rich history here and I would like to explore. So yeah, you fast for a day for that, but it's different because you know, you're in a tent and there's a guy with rattles and stuff. So no, I was, <laughs> I was new to fasting. Okay. So what was that experience like? Cause we've watched a lot of our community go into these long fasts and it can be quite brutal well uh, in the book i talk about a spiritual fast as something that is meaningful and it's different than the benefits of fasting that a lot of us are looking for so you could say like i want to fast to improve my gut i want to fast because i don't want to be old i don't want my metabolism to work right i want to be wise as i age but i don't want my body to be old right and you go through all these different things, but sometimes you're fasting for spiritual and emotional and psychological awareness. And they're just different things. Uh, so I, I went in there and said, look, I have a, a fear that I've identified because I work in my personal development work. I'm afraid of being alone. It puts, makes me choose to be in bad relationships. That's not good. Uh, I also know because I weigh 300 pounds, I have a fear of being hungry because they told me if you don't eat six times a day, you'll go into starvation mode. And I know very well because uh, um, I know what happens if I don't eat. I get hypoglybitchy. I start yelling at people <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's your fault. Blah. And these are real things that affect real people. And I know because they affected me. Yep. And as we're here now, I haven't had anything yet today. We're recording around five o'clock and it's just because I had other stuff to do. Right. It, it's not costing me to fast today, but there were many times in my life where this would have been, oh my God, it's the end of the world. So it was for me feeling like, look, if I have a, a protein bar with me, which I was going to sneak one just in case I need it, right? And I literally had it in my backpack and at the last minute I left it at the shaman's house who dropped me off in the desert in the middle of nowhere. And I write about that in, in Fast This Way because this idea, is it going to be easy to fast or is it going to be hard to fast? My whole point is do everything you can to set yourself up to not feel pain. So no, you don't need to go on a four-day spiritual fast or you know, just meditate on hunger and lack. And, blah, and you can do that and it's good for you, but it's not supposed to hurt to fast. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the, the thing here. It's not like, oh man, I'm thinking about food all the time. What if we use biology to just turn off the voice in your head, the one that I really lived with for four days so I could get to know it, you can control the biology so the voice won't even talk to you. And then the fast was like, yeah, I guess I fasted for 24 hours. That was nice. <laughs> but like, <laughs> Did you, were, you able, were you able to bring the protein bar into the cave with you? You know, I could have, but I told myself, you know, I, I probably would cheat and I know I would have. So at the last minute, I just left it on the dining room table and plus protein bars really sucked back then. This was, yeah. you know, in 2008. They're Ugh. like, power bars and yeah. uh, tiger milk bar. I used right. to have a tiger milk bar when I was a kid and I thought that was the most amazing thing. Exactly. And you're like, oh, that's kind of a candy bar, right? Yeah, and absolutely. you couldn't get a low carb protein bar back then and the protein was not good protein at all. 
yeah. So it, for me, it was, it was a way of jumping in, but it was also a way of holding myself accountable. It, yeah. It's incredibly easy. And, it, and this is something your, your listeners and that you know very well. You say you're going to fast for 24 hours and then something happens and you don't. Mm. And then you say, oh, I'm a bad person, I'm weak. But that's actually not what happened, right? Do you want me to walk you through the biology of it? it yeah, I, I please, it because this is why I want to start with it, because we have hundreds of thousands of people that are trying to get to that three to four day water fast, but the mind holds them back. So please walk us through okay. it. So what's happening here is that there is a distributed system of ancient bacteria that run your body, and they're actually in charge. And when I say they're in charge, they're, they're embedded in your cells, and there's hundreds to thousands of them. They're called mitochondria. You've probably heard of them as the power plant of the cells. And I wrote a, a very successful New York Times Science monthly bestseller book about mitochondria in the brain because you can use them to upgrade your brain. The problem is that two billion years ago, we tell ourselves, oh, we were these cells and we harness these little bacteria to become our mobile power plants. You could say that's true. Now, the power plants... They're like, well, 2 billion years ago, we found these floating Petri dishes and we moved in, we took over and now we have mobile Petri dishes. It's awesome. These people walk around and they do what we tell them to do. And they even convince themselves that they chose to do what we wanted them to do. So they are actively working to make you do what they want. Mm -hmm. And just like all life forms, they're lazy. They do not like to expend more energy than is necessary to get what they want. And well, they're bacteria. They aren't that smart. So they follow the basic algorithm of all life. And this is something, no, I do not have a clinical study that says this. I did study artificial research, or sorry, artificial intelligence. And <laughs> I've done a lot of research on distributed systems. I taught at the University of California about how to build these big distributed internet things. Our mitochondria are doing that. So what they do is they run a simple set of rules. It's four rules. And they run these all the time. And a cactus runs the rules and a zebra runs the rules and all people run these rules. It's how life continues to exist. It's the fundamental rules that there's nothing else you can strip away and nothing else needs to be added. And it's funny because that'll fit inside the thought processes of a bacteria. Step one, run away from, kill, or hide from scary things. Okay? You got to do that otherwise a tiger eats you and then your species is dead. Right? At least if you're the last one of your species and the bacteria are too dumb to know. So, hey, you gotta, gotta play it that way. So, 10 times more energy goes into fear and stress than it actually needs because you could die. Right? And that's also how the whole coronavirus, you know, social media phenomenon also is just becoming such a big stressor. It's because we put 10 times more energy towards things that could be a threat. Right? It's not to say it isn't a threat, but it's like the energy. Yep. Next up, famine has killed every single thing that's alive at least once in the history of its species. So we're very worried about famine. So that means these dumb little mitochondria who have no idea there's a bag of M&Ms available. They're sitting there going with five times more energy than is necessary, eat everything. Mm. The third thing the mitochondria do, so we have fear, we have food, and what else does all life have to do, Mindy, in order to stay alive? It's also an F word. It has to, I was gonna say it has to procreate. But that's not an F word. <laughs> It has to fuck. It oh, my God. I was talking fertility. Oh. Oh my, you're going to make me blush. Oh, my goodness. I, I'm so embarrassed for you. No, I'm just <laughs> I made you say it. Uh, but, yeah, it's the other F word, right? Yeah, and we put three say, times. I saw what was in the book. I, I, got, a little, I got a little hint. <laughs> so, but you made me say it. I did make you say it. But, it, but it, it's one of those things where, okay, we all do it, right? And it's because it gets three times more energy than it's probably worth. And then you sit there and you scratch your head and you go, okay, is there anything I've ever done that I'm ashamed of that didn't come from one of those things? No. Every time you've procrastinated, every time you didn't take a risk that you wish you would have taken, every bad decision you made, I promise you, there was fear, there was hunger, or there was, that's a nice pair of legs and I really want to go play with them and I know I shouldn't. Like, like this is the, the foundations of where shame comes from because these dumb little things, these dumb little mitochondria bacteria are running our day-to-day, second-by-second decision-making. So they're giving you the urges, right? And then you convince yourself, you know what? Eating that cookie right now is a really good idea. Mm-hmm. Oh, it'll be okay if I break my fast. And my experience as a fat person, and I get to say that because I weigh 300 pounds. And so if, you, if that triggers you, then go to a therapist. So I was fat. I have stretch marks to prove it. And if you look at what's going on in your head. It's when it sets the cookies in front of you. You said, today I will not have the cookie. And then the cookie says, eat me. And you say, no. 
It says, eat me, no. And pretty soon it's like a two-year-old pestering you. Eat me, no, eat me, no, eat me, no. And finally like, okay, I'll just have half. Right? And at the end of the meeting, we're end of the day, like, God, why did I do that? It's because at the second you picked up the cookie, there was enough pressure on you. And the pressure comes from the voice in your head that is generated by the system and the fact that they can turn down your energy. And they're getting stressed and they're panicking going, oh my goodness, we're going to die because we don't have enough food. And you know, the truth is they are, which is awesome. Because when they don't have enough food, they have to take the weak ones and kill them and replace them with young ones. Autophagy, autophagy, right? These are good things, but they don't want to do that. They're just like us. Like we don't want to cull the herd of the weak ones. You know, no one wants to do that. But by using things like, cold exposure, like intermittent fasting, like longer fasts and things like that, you're just telling them, hey, you live in an environment where you don't get to choose. And then pretty soon they clean up their act. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, we actually don't need the cookie. We were totally wrong. We have enough reserve that the cookie loses its voice. And well said. Thank you. The, The big knowledge that's in fast this way is that there's three different things you can do during a fast that give you all or most of the benefits of most kinds of fasts that completely turn off the voice and allow you to experience the benefits of fasting during a busy work day when you have stuff to do, right? And this is how, if I'm going to do a three or four day fast, this is how I start the first couple of days because you still get the fast. You just don't feel the pain during the first two days where it's rough. So the big three fasting hacks are, The first two are based on ketones. And I'm sure your listeners know about ketosis to a certain point. What you might not know, though, is that if you're one of the the keto bros, like, if you eat a carb, you're a bad person never again. Keto bros. (laughs) (laughs) We don't know any keto bros in our world. No, we we don't know anyone like that. Um, And I kind of just, I'm like, this is not going to end well. And it actually doesn't work to always be in ketosis. So that's cycling in and out, especially for women. It's true for men and women, but women hit the wall first from that. So what's going on there, though, is is a small amount of ketones, less than you get from nutritional ketosis, a level of 0.5 on a little finger stick. Normally, they say you're in ketosis around one or something. Normally, you have 0.1 or no, no ketones. So it's a meaningful level. If you can get up to that level, that turns on a hormone called CCK, cholecystokinin, uh, or you can just remember it's the Calvin Klein hormone, CCK. And when you, uh, when you raise that one, that's the satiety hormone. It makes you feel full. So if you use just a tiny blip of ketones, you're like, oh, I'm not hungry. And then the hunger hormone, ghrelin, it also, right at about 0.5, the, the actual numbers are 0.38 and 0.48, but I just say 0.5 because it's easy. And at that level, then your ghrelin levels drop. You're like, oh my God, the cookie lost its power. It's not even talking to me. I just don't want the cookie. My willpower is is in reserve for something else because you've manipulated those things. So one way you can double your ketone production in the morning is the amount of caffeine in two small cups of black coffee. So it's okay to have coffee during a fast. And there are very few reasons you wouldn't want to do that. Some people say, well, in the mouse studies, the mice only had water. Like mice don't have espresso machines. It's okay. But if you look <laughs> at the, the biology, you're actually doing something really beneficial because beneficial gut bacteria that thin people have, they eat polyphenols as a food source. So if you give yourself coffee that's just coffee, no protein, no sugar, what happens is they're like, oh, I guess the ones that make you thin will grow because they have food and they'll outcompete the ones that make you fat that wanted sugar or in some cases Brilliant. protein. Okay, so black coffee is okay during a fast, right? Don't even have a before three bed. Day, even like a three day water fast. It's, it's yes. part of the secret. Yes. And you can do that in the morning. You do it at lunch. And on day three, you'll probably want one cup because your cortisol levels are higher. You're feeling good already. You lost your hunger. But if you're like, man, I'm really feeling some urges, right? It's okay to have a cup of coffee. Like it, it's okay. Right. And you might even have some tea. That's okay too. Just, you know, don't put weird creamers in it. Yeah. You just okay. made like hundreds of thousands of people so happy. I ha- I cannot tell you how my resetters are going to love this news. Go ahead. Keep going. But well, this is exciting to hear. If, if fasting, you could say at an extreme level, it's going without calories, but fasting itself is just going without. And you can choose what you go without. The keto diet is a fast. It's a fast from carbs. Right? Like the vegan diet is a fast from animal food. 
right? You can do all sorts of different types of things where I'm going to selectively go without something for a period of time. And it is a fast and they have different benefits depending on what you allow and what you don't allow. You can fast from social media. It's a fast. You're going without. Mm -hmm. And I write about all those different aspects of it in, in fast this way. But let's stick with the other fasting hack for turning off hunger. Okay. Please. The first one was coffee because it can double your ketone production. The second one is, you're, I'm going to sound like a broken record. And at this point, if you drink Bulletproof coffee, it is not going to change my life. People have lost a million pounds on the Bulletproof diet. The company is a sizable company and all that. So I will tell you though, that the MCT oil that we use and have used for 10 years in it, which is an eight carbon chain MCT oil, it quadruples ketone production compared to coconut oil, which only raises awesome. ketones as much as sleeping for eight hours. So coconut oil, not so good. Regular MCT oil doesn't raise ketones maybe more than twice as much. The eight carbon, it's one of the subtypes, raises ketones the most. So if you were to put a dollop of butter into your black coffee and you were to put some of the C8 MCT oil, and yes, I like the Bulletproof stuff because I created it and all that, um, and then you blend it, that's really important to blend it. So you're going to get ketones there, but here's a secret from the Tibetans. And I love this because the idea for Bulletproof Coffee emerged when I was in Silicon Valley after I came back from Tibet and I had yak butter tea at 18,000 feet elevation. Now, your body's job, take air, about 30 pounds of air every day, and food, however much you eat, mix them together, make electrons. Same electrons that you know power your iPhone. But when we drink water... What we have to do is we have to use electrons to convert the water from the kind of water we drink into something called exclusion zone water. Now, there are all sorts of people who will sell you magic fairy crystal water or alkaline water that is not probably a good idea for you. But this is different. There's research at the University of Washington, and I funded the research, but I didn't fund it to say, I'd want you to do this or do that. It, it was like an open thing to, to look at, at open biochemistry from Dr. Gerald Pollock, who's written several books about this. So I consider this to be uh, real science. Plus, you can see it on a microscope. When you take water and you put it next to butter fat or MCT oil, the structure of the water changes near the oil. It's called a lipid membrane. By the way, every cell in your body is made of lipid membranes. And when you expose that water to 1,200 nanometer light, it's called body heat. And when you do that, <laughs> it converts the water from the water we drink into the water that you use to make ATP and to fold proteins. In other words, to, to perform biological reactions, we change the water a little bit. Well, in Tibet, I watch these people half my size carry three times the weight I, I carry at sub-freezing temperatures, wearing cotton knockoff Levi's, tennis shoes, and a vest. And I'm like wearing parkas and I'm shivering and cold. And these are superhumans. And for breakfast, yak butter tea, and like two tablespoons of barley flour. I'm like, this is not possible. What they learned, they blend their yak butter tea. And before they could blend, they've spent 10 minutes. And I watched them do this with a butter churn, just mixing, 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 mixing. Why did they do that? Because they are turning the water into the kind of water your body needs to make energy. So you're fasting. You don't have extra calories. That's one of the reasons we get cold when we fast, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what if you did the work in the water so your cells didn't have to heat up the water and they could directly use the water to fold proteins, to perform autophagy and do other metabolic activity? Well, when you blend that little bit of butter, it doesn't have to be a lot, it can be a tiny bit, and you blend the MCT oil in for the ketones, you're changing the structure of the water so that during the fast, you're like, oh, my cells can do their job, right? And it really changes things. And we're not talking about a lot of calories here. It might be 100 calories. It might be 50 calories. You're changing the water in your coffee. And if you put enough MCT oil in there, it has calories, but they cannot be stored as fat. Third parties have validated no change in insulin levels from drinking Bulletproof coffee, which is very important. It's, in fact, it was On the everybody? lowest change. Um, well, the study that they did showed no one uh, showed no change. There may be someone out there who has a change, if, especially if they use tons and tons of butter. But if you're using normal amounts like that, you're not putting protein, you're not putting carbohydrate in there. It's flat. Yeah. Okay. And as and, many cups as you want, you can go throughout well, the day. You, I mean, if you have 4,000 calories of butter and MCT oil during a fast, there are studies that show that overfeeding, just too many calories in a day, um, are, it's not good for you. That said, I did lose weight when I ate 4,500 calories a day for a year. 
<laughs> when I was experimenting for the Bulletproof Diet, I wrote the big book on that in 2014. And it's still like a, in, as a top seller list because it just works so well. It's bad for you. Don't do that. But I was trying to prove, I guess I'm supposed to be gaining weight, but how is it that if the calories in and calories out are the same thing? Yeah. No, it's food composition, food timing, fasting, all that. So what I'm saying here though, is that if you had a cup of Bulletproof coffee in the morning and maybe one at lunch, you will just not give any cares about food. And yep. your, your protein digestion machinery in the liver, pancreatic enzymes, they will continue to do what your body is supposed to when you're fasting. And I've validated this in my own deep research. I interviewed Sim Land, who wrote a book called Metabolic Autophagy, yep. who says exactly the same thing, even which types of autophagy stay on. So this is a real genuine fasting hack that works. It's called Bulletproof intermittent Fasting, and people, a lot of people have done it. So you don't have to do it, but if it's your first time fasting and you're afraid of it, or you're just like, I have such profound cravings, I have a big meeting. Like, how am I going to be a parent at home with a big meeting, and I've got you know, my Zoom shirt and tie, and I'm wearing board shorts, but my kids are right around screaming, and I'm just trying to focus, and I'm hungry. Okay. A lot of us aren't going to perform at our best like that. But if it's a day where I wanted the benefits, I didn't want the pain, you can do that and you will get benefits. And yeah. this is like 10 years of that. I see people screaming sometimes, that's cheating. That's, yes, it's cheating. Okay, fine. Yeah, but I won and I got the benefits. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And oh my gosh, you have no idea how my resetters, this is when this podcast launches because we get questions all the time. What can I drink in a fasted state? And um, what I've been really emphasizing is do your own self-science. Look at your blood sugar. Do a blood sugar reading, drink your bulletproof or whatever you want to drink. And then yeah. half hour later, there you go. Look and see where your blood sugar's at. So if somebody does what you just said and their blood sugar goes up, are they still in a fasted state? You are still in a fasted state if your blood sugar goes up. In fact, what happens in the body whenever your blood sugar drops too low is the body says, oh, I've got this. It's an emergency. Have some cortisol and adrenaline because those two hormones do a great job of liberating glucose they from do. tissues. Yes, For everyone do. listening right now, if you wake up between three and four in the morning with racing thoughts, what happened is that your body needed enough blood sugar to do the cleaning processes in the brain. And it went so low, the body's like, I got this, have some cortisol. And so now your blood sugar's up, the brain's happy, but you're not asleep. And then you do this over and over. And I said this earlier, but women tend to have that problem more often and sooner than men when they start fasting or doing a ketogenic diet, which is one reason it's important to not fast all the time. That's starvation. Uh, but, you know, right. to, to, to be kind to yourself. The, the hack for that, and now this is going to really piss some people off. Okay. If you have a problem with sleep and you're fasting, some people will tell you, oh, if you have less than 50 calories, it's still a fast or 100 calories or less than 10 grams of this or that. Well, that depends on what you wanted to get out of your fast. If your intent was to give your gut a rest and to take nothing in, maybe you just want to have water and salt, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's okay. But for the vast majority of us, uh, you can have some other things like that. And if you wanted to get through the night and sleep and be functional and you're not doing a spiritual fast, maybe when you're just really having a hard time, if you were to take a teaspoon or two of raw honey, not in hot water, it's not raw anymore. Raw honey specifically in studies goes to liver glycogen, not muscle glycogen, at least not as much, a very small amount. And then that liver glycogen will be called on by the brain when it needs it because liver glycogen, which is the store of carbohydrate in the body, it goes into the brain first. So when you do that, now the brain's like, I got just enough. You might see a slight bump in your blood sugar when you do that. You can have some cinnamon with it if you want to blunt that or some chromium. And I talk about, by the way, fast as well, it has a list of supplements you can take when you're fasting, supplements you can't take when you're fasting. One's a, I call them the Barfy Four. <laughs> <laughs> supplements that are not going to end well if you take those on a fast. Yep. Uh, so when you look at all that, though, that might be worth doing because you're still fasting. You're not eating. You're getting a very nominal amount of calories, but you're giving the brain what it needs to let you sleep when you're fasting, which is going to be more benefit than harm. Well, we're going to test that on, a, on, a, on hundreds of thousands of people because so that, cool. that is one of the complaints that we get. There's two major ones from our community. One is I'm not sleeping on the longer fast. The other one, and I want to dive into at some point here, is women who are losing their hair. They're oh, like so this. like uh, yeah. fasting, fasting, fasting fiends because it keeps their weight where they want. But meanwhile, they're losing their hair and they're not sleeping. Okay, and we're going to hack that. Let's hack it because okay. that is like three-fourths of my community. 
Yep. The hair loss thing is a major problem for men too. And um, there's definitely things to do. There's one other fasting hack that I want to talk about that is oh, new to fast this way. And I, I didn't put that one in the Bulletproof Diet book because I didn't know about it back then. And there are certain types of soluble prebiotic fibers. These are fibers that your body cannot digest, but your gut bacteria will digest them. They'll feed the good guys. And those gut bacteria will turn them into butyric acid and propionic acid, which are, funny enough, fatty acids that are ketogenic. So yeah. they also turn off hunger hormones like no one's business. So if you were to take your cup of black coffee and you would add a tiny bit of butter, you would add some MCT oil, maybe a teaspoon to a tablespoon, and 10 or 20 grams of soluble fiber and you blend it up, it still tastes like coffee, but you'll be so full you just won't even care. You can do that for an intermittent fast or for a longer fast. Now, if the intent is to let your gut bacteria rest, um, there's things that happen in your gut bacteria. When they get stressed, they make something called a lipopolysaccharide. Um, which is, or LPS, you might've seen it called. And yep. LPS crosses a blood-brain barrier. It's implicated in all sorts of diseases and it's implicated in chronic inflammation. And your body has systems to protect you from some of it. But when you're fasting, if you're feeding the good guys, um, you're not gonna get that issue in the same way. And look, sometimes you might not wanna do that during a fast. I find that it works very well during a fast. You still lose the weight, you still lose the water weight, you still are getting autophagy, but you've taken care of your gut bacteria in a different way. So someone who's brand new to fasting has never tried it before. If you try the three fasting hacks from Fast This Way, like I just described, the first day, you're like, oh my God, I made it. And I skipped breakfast. I had less than 100 calories. None of the calories affected my blood sugar or my protein. I'm feeling good and I did it. And maybe the next day you'll move it around. Right? And, and that's the idea here. It's the crutch. It's like a crutch to kind yeah. of let get you into right. that state. What soluble fiber? Fiber like any any? Do you, does Bulletproof have a brand that you put? Bulletproof in does have one. I, I'm not here to sell the Bulletproof brand. It's the one I formulated. It's called Bulletproof Inner Fuel, and the primary ingredient in most of them, including mine, is acacia gum, which is a sap from a tree. And I use two other similar things: a hydrolyzed guar gum and larch or ribinogalactan, or what they're called, okay. because the studies show those feed the good guys the most. It has a very neutral flavor. So you can put that in and, and it, it dissolves instantly and, and it, you just like mix it in and it goes away. It doesn't make things slick, thick and sludgy. It's not Metamucil. That, that is um, yeah. a coarse yeah. fiber. Um, that's yeah. indigestible fiber. This is a different thing. And they call it prebiotic fiber. And when you do that, you're like, whoa, things are so different here. And your state changes and your hunger changes and you still got the benefits. And what I really recommend people do when they're starting out, especially with the women who are losing their hair and all, you don't have to fast every day. Mm. And look, we know about exercise and overtraining. And a lot of people do that too. When I weighed 300 pounds, I'm like, this is the most important thing ever. I am so done with this. So I went to the gym six days a week, an hour and a half a day, half weights, half cardio. I was on the treadmill with a backpack, 15 degrees, walking really fast. I could lift it. I could max out all but two of the machines. I still had a 46 inch waist and I weighed 300 pounds after 18 uh, months of that. And I was eating the chicken salad, with no chicken and no dressing. And I was on a low fat diet. It just didn't work. Right. And it was so frustrating um, in order to have that happen. But I was overtraining. Right. And I did get more autoimmunity. This happens quite a lot. So if you can over exercise, you can also over fast. Yes. Yeah. Women hit the wall before men do. It is because, and I, I write, there's a whole chapter for women in yeah, Fast Thank This Way. You. I saw that. It's okay. Awesome. You read that one? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, it, it's like what you want to do is maybe, this is going to sound really crazy, have breakfast sometimes. Right. You, you don't have to do it every day. Yeah. Three to five days a week for women works best. And I say this after years of dealing with the Bulletproof community and helping people go through this where, oh, wait, my sleep returned. Or what if when you broke your fast, you weren't in strike keto? You know, when you're having breakfast, don't have carbs. Carbs are generally bad for breakfast. Have some protein, have some fat. And then the next day, have only fat or have nothing. And yeah, generally variation. people- yeah, women do better when they get some fat in the morning, but it's totally okay to do just a straight water fast, but you probably don't need to do it every other week, maybe once a month, maybe once every three months. But if your cycle is off or if you're already stressed emotionally, it is a bad time to fast. Yes. It is 
also a bad time to go to the gym and, and push really hard. Yes. And we have that just do it culture that says, well, I'm a strong woman and I have yoga pants. So I'm going to go to the gym and I know today's been a horrible day and I'm going to burn off my stress. Okay. This is what special forces people do. Like, okay, I just had a firefight. I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to burn off my extra cortisol. It works for peak cortisol where like there's a big stress, but when it's chronic stress like that, it actually adds to the chronic stress. So fasting and exercise when you're already depleted are not a good idea. You know what yeah. works? It's amazing. Sleep. And yep. before you go to sleep, have some carbs already. I didn't say cheesecake. I didn't say corn syrup, right? But have yep. some carbs and you'll be so much better off. And then the next day when you slept really well and you're like feeling centered, even if you gained a little bit of water weight, that's okay. Um, get a, those Spanx or whatever, you'll be fine, right? And then, <laughs> and just like, like do your fast that day, right? What I do is I track my sleep and I talk about sleep and fasting and how they mix in the book, but I've tra tracked my sleep for 15 years because I was such a bad sleeper <laughs> and I am now a really good sleeper. And if you have a good sleep tracker, it'll tell you how stressed are you in the morning. It's called a readiness score or your heart rate variability score. If you're already blown out, maybe you're on your cycle, maybe you had a big fight. It's just not a good day to fast and you're going to yeah. wake up. You're not going to have the pancakes but you might have the bacon and it's okay. I think that's the fear though. People are like, well, if fasting works so well for me and then I give myself per permission to eat, then I'm going to really go off the deep end and I'm not yep. going to be able to pull myself back in. I actually have a funny story around people fasting too much. And this is sort of how my resetter movement started is that I started putting videos out on my YouTube channel on fasting and autophagy. And all the people who had been following Dr. Fung's obesity code, they had lost a ton of weight with, yep. with fasting and they were one meal a day heads, you know, just doing it all the time, hardcore. And meanwhile, I was teaching my people how to vary their fasts. Yeah. And then they found my channel and they were like, oh, you mean I'm not supposed to do this all the time? And we started teaching them how to vary it. And just like you said, when people went in and out of a fasted state, the hair stopped falling out. They yeah. were like getting stuck with weight loss. But it is that push it through mentality and people struggle to be able to eat again once they feel like fasting is their way into better health. It, I call it the, the fasting trap in the book and it's similar to two other traps I've experienced in my life. And my favorite one is the vegan trap. Mm. So I was a raw vegan, I'm gonna call myself a devout raw vegan. So this was maybe before, before social media, actually. So I, I read some books and I said, all right, it's got to be about enzymes. I'm going to do this. And I actually lost a bunch of weight and I felt great for the first six weeks. But if you do something and you do it with focus and you do it for six weeks and you feel great and you've lost weight, you know it works and it's now a habit and you will yep. keep doing it. And when it stops working, you're like, oh, maybe that wasn't raw enough. <laughs> right. So let so, me do more. Exactly. Yeah. So you double down, right? Totally double down. Yeah. And you could say, oh, I'm going to go keto. And I hear this, especially from women, but from men too. Like, yeah, I went keto. I was so good. I lost all this weight. And now I've lost half the weight I had to lose. Now I'm stuck. My hair is falling out. I can't sleep. But I know that if I just ate six grams of carbs instead of 10, I'll be fine. <laughs> No. Okay. I have done that too. That's called the Atkins diet. And I did that a long time ago. I lost 50 of my hundred pounds and the other 50 took me another 10 years to lose because that's how complex inflammation and timing and all this stuff is. So you can do it into the fasting trap. Oh, fasting works. Therefore I'll do it all the time. Few humans can do really well on OMAD all the time. They will for a while. They'll be convinced it works because their life rocks. And then suddenly, if you get their labs, their hormones are all over the place. The reason women and men are losing the hair from this, and by the way, I like to think my hair is doing all right. Um, <laughs> it looks good to me. I cheated. But anyway, <laughs> that's a different story. Uh, the, uh, um, the problem is, number one, cortisol. If, your cortisol. if you fast, your cortisol is going to go up. And that's okay because you're fasting for brief periods of time. And, and cortisol right. and adrenaline are part of that. But Excessive cortisol all the time, you can measure that, right? The other thing, though, that's a major issue that we don't talk about is thyroid. And when you fast for short periods of time or you go on a vegan diet with the wrong, the wrong fat content in it, your cells will temporarily upregulate your thyroid function. Then you're like, woohoo, I feel good. 
and then your thyroid crashes. And if you pull an advanced thyroid panel from someone whose hair is falling out and you pull a 24 hour cortisol panel with saliva, you pretty much find out, oh look, your cortisol's broken, you should have some salt in the morning, some adrenal extract and some licorice root and eat some damn breakfast for a couple of weeks until you get back on your feet. You can still have a cup of coffee in the morning if you have adrenal dysfunction, just don't go crazy on it because the coffee actually raises cortisol in the morning when you want it, just don't have it at night. And you do that sort of thing and you say, oh, thyroid, man, I might have to go on some low dose thyroid therapy just until I get my thyroid back. And maybe you should take some iodine during a fast to help support your thyroid. Wouldn't that be amazing? You can absolutely do that. So things like that become, oh, that's why it's happening. But yeah. the number one reason it's happening is because we like habits. I'm going to go to the gym every day. You're, gonna, you're not going to recover ever. I'm going to fast every day, every day. You're not going to rebuild ever. So yes, it sucks. I want to do the same thing every day without thinking about it for the rest of my life because then I could think about other stuff. But fast sometimes, have breakfast sometimes, but whenever you eat, eat the foods that don't make you think about food. I talked to a guy just uh, earlier today. Um, he's lost a bunch of weight. He's you know, super bulletproof. He's like, man, every time I eat eggs, I get hungry right afterwards. I have to eat two of your bulletproof bars right afterwards. I'm like, stop eating eggs. You're allergic to them. That's the problem, right? You shouldn't need to eat a protein bar after breakfast. So yeah. that's for him a trigger food. Eggs are common. They're either really good for you or if you're allergic, they're going to they're gonna sabotage a fast or just eating without snacking. And there's a whole set of foods that I allude to in fast this way that were the, the focus of the Bulletproof diet, they will ruin your ability to survive and thrive without hunger because they make you hungry all the time. What are those? Uh, do, can you give us a little sneak? Yeah. Peek? Kale. What? Kale's evil. It tastes I, gross. Anyone who eats kale wants to eat food <laughs> afterwards. That's just, that's why you I always mix kale it. kale last night. Right. But what did you have on it? Oh, well, I mixed it with other lettuces and I actually make a wicked salad with watermelon radishes, kale and uh, green apples. And then I yeah. put a little olive oil and just some lemon oil. juice. Yeah. And, then, I, and that actually, was it. A little bit of honey. I do some raw there honey you in go. there. Yeah. You can't eat kale without sugar <laughs> or without deep frying it in bad fats or covering it in bacon or something. Here's what's going on with kale. Kale is full of something called oxalic acid. And it's a defense compound. And this is why throughout history, no one would eat raw kale, including I, I am an organic farmer. I have a small organic farm. My pigs spit out raw kale. Pigs and humans have the same liver and kidney setup. So why do they do that? Because the oxalic acid in kale sticks to calcium in your blood. It moves around in the body and it causes inflammation, which tells the body, I need to fix the inflammation, which tells the body, hey, could I have some glucose already? And it goes, I don't need glucose. Here, let me give you some stress hormones. And then you get some glucose. It sticks in joints. It's a major cause of kidney stones in people now because they're consuming so much, especially raw kale. And it's tied to something called vulvodynia, uh, which is when the crystals form in the labia. And uh, you don't want that. <laughs> because- wow. <laughs> okay. I've actually, on our heavy metal test too, I've seen people actually, their um, heavy metal loads Allium. go up. Yes. Yeah. And when we try to unpack it, we find out they're big kale eaters. It's, it's almost universal. If thallium is high, you're eating a lot of the brassica family and yep. in particular kale, which is the highest one. So raw spinach and raw kale are very likely to make you hungry and create mineral deficiencies because of oxalic acid, which is unbelievable because they're supposed to be so healthy, right. except throughout all of history. You know, we, ate, we, ate, we wouldn't eat kale. It was garnish. But when we ate spinach, your grandma, what, how did she eat spinach? She, she cooked it. She cooked it, and what did she put on it? Salt. Salt? That's she what, didn't my, make cream spinach? It, cream spinach is, is the standard way. No, not my grandma. My grandma okay, not your grandma. Make. So <laughs> most grandmas did cream spinach because the calcium would bind to the calcium uh, or to the oxalate that's in the spinach. And then when you ate it, you wouldn't suck calcium out of your body and cause the inflammatory reaction. So those are not things to eat raw. The next category of food is phytates. If you're on a whole foods diet, Whatever whole foods means, I'm not entirely sure um, because you don't eat the skin of the watermelon now, do you? But whatever uh, is going on there is the outer layer of beans and grains contains phytic acid. Phytic acid is there to keep animals from eating them because when you eat it, you can't absorb zinc, copper, or any of the other minerals. And for every gram of plant-based protein that contains phytic acid, which is almost all of it, you need another gram of animal protein just to cancel out the phytic acid so you can absorb your zinc. 
So you will have hunger because you don't have minerals because you ate these, you know, incredibly healthy whole wheat, whatever. No, it wasn't healthy. It's going to cause cravings. So are you, a, are you a fan then of the carnivore diet? You know, on the, the Bulletproof Roadmap, which kind of puts every type of food in, you know, not going to cause cravings, suspect, and kryptonite, the carnivore diet is totally green on the Bulletproof diet. Anyone can do carnivore, but there's also the carnivore trap. And carnivore is yes. just fasting from plants. However, you most likely, and carnivore people get really mad when I say this, um, even though I'm friends with some of them, it's like you're most likely going to like it for a month or six weeks. And after that, your gut bacteria will shift. And what you end up going to is this really weird diet where it's got grass-fed animals. It's got non-inflammatory, non-seed oils, because seed oils, omega-6s, trigger hunger and they're bad for your cells. And it's got low inflammatory plants. That's called the Bulletproof Diet. So, but th that's generally where carnivore people go. But yes, do carnivore for four weeks. It'll change your life because for the first time ever, you're going without oxalic acid, without phytic acid, without mycotoxins from plants, which is another one of the major categories. And there's also lectins, which were a big focus of the Bulletproof uh, Diet in even 2010. I'm like, guys, these things are inflammatory. And you might want to just try going without the nightshade family. For me, it fixed the arthritis that runs in my family. I've had arthritis diagnosed when I was 14 years old on my knees. I could barely walk around Tibet because of uh, joint problems. I don't have joint pain anymore because I figured out the food that triggered it. So lectins may cause profound cravings for you. If you eat a red bell pepper and you're hungry afterwards, well, there you go. Or if you eat a red bell pepper and you're fine, great, you're not sensitive, it's all good. Yeah. But it's individualized. So you gotta find the trigger foods for you. And anything fried in bad oils, which is anything at a restaurant that's fried, is just going to make you hungry later. That's how yeah. it is. So what do you say to vegans? Because this comes up all the time. Like we have in our resetter tribe, like we have fights between the carnivore and the, and the vegans and everybody wants to be right. And then you yeah. look at like Paul Saladino's research and his book and it's like, whoa, and what you're saying, how do we, if we start villainizing vegetables, then what, what's left to eat? Well, what I say to vegans is please don't reproduce until you have a healthier diet. <laughs> because it's not fair to your children. Okay. Now, my first book was called The Better Baby Book, and it's resulted in hundreds and hundreds of pregnancies. And it's what we use to fix my wife's biology, my wife's a medical doctor, so we could have two kids at age 39 and 42 with no IVF and no external drug kind of Powerful. therapies just by fixing food. She was diagnosed as infertile when I met her. So, I will tell you after 1300 references in that book, please don't be a vegan. You need certain types of saturated fat that you simply cannot get and a bunch of other nutrients. It is simply not sustainable and it's also bad for the soil and it's bad for animals. Yeah. Also, don't eat industrial animals because those are even worse. Okay. <laughs> so, so what do you eat? So what is that? What give Grass us fed like the meat or okay. nothing. Okay. If it didn't right. eat grass and it's, and it's a cow or a sheep, it's not okay, Right. Chicken isn't a great food, but a lot of people eat it. Eat organic chicken that didn't, that at least that ate organic corn and soy, or ideally were pastured and ate worms the way they should. That's what they eat on my farm. Um, you can eat um, vegetables. You just eat the low inflammation vegetables. And on the carnivore diet thing, and I, I like to tease Paul, I call him James for some reason. I did that once <laughs> in an interview. So now I was, hey, James. Uh, but what's going on there is, you know what? Most people handle cooked carrots or raw carrots pretty well. You can have some of those. Right, and if you can't handle them, don't. Things like the old ones, lettuce, celery, uh, radishes. And in each of those, if you wanna like go out there and say, look, there, look, there's this bad thing in there, there's this bad thing in there. Every food that's from the plant kingdom can be a medicine and all of them have toxins and all of them have beneficial things in them. We have this thing we do, it's called cooking that we have done throughout all of history to reduce the toxin load and increase the nutrient load. We just suck at cooking because we do it for flavor instead of biology. Well, there's another thing we can do now. It's called making supplements. So you can take turmeric extract where you get rid of a bunch of the stuff that was in there and you take the active parts of it that do what you want. And I love it when carnivores are like, you don't need to take supplements. I'm like, this is great. If you agree that you're only gonna get your toxins from mother nature, then you should get all your nutrients from mother nature, except the toxins we swim in are not from mother nature. You actually need to support your body's detox pathways. And it's okay to take supplements. In fact, it's good. It's yep. just like cooking. It's a way yep. of extracting nutrients from food and getting them into the body. 
So some of them are more moderate than others. There's some like Dave said soluble fiber is good for you. He's not kind of, or he's not one of us. I didn't want you on you. It's okay, guys. Um, what I, so what I say to, to both the carnivores and the vegans is, guys, chill out. Neither one of you is living in a way that any humans have lived for multiple generations. Both of you can draw your labs and both of you can say, I am going to transform my view of my labs to say that they're healthy even though they're not. I was a devout, devoted raw vegan until my teeth started breaking and I got autoimmune conditions and it broke my thyroid and my hair was falling out. Um, took me a while to figure that one out, right? And then get this, it takes two years to replace half the cell membranes in your body. And I published that research, I think, in, in 2014 in the Bulletproof Diet. So that means if you start eating tomorrow, the kind of fat you're made out of, newsflash, it's grass-fed butter. <laughs> it is, it's grass-fed steak. That's the fat you're made of. You're not made out of corn oil. You're not made out of soybean oil. Those are toxic oils, right? You just don't do those because they're bad building blocks, right? You need a very small That's amount of those things. Grass-fed meat has about 2% omega-6s in it. That's probably about what you need. You won't run out of those. So and what, do you, what do you say yeah. like, so that now we've got like theories and this is some of the things that I've been trying to help people navigate in my community because we've got like Rob Wolf saying, hey, you know what? You, conventional meat is okay to eat. And then you've got like- Okay, I, I'm yeah, just gonna go say this. Rob, Rob's an angry dude. <laughs> okay, sorry, Rob. Okay. Love you, brother. You need to get a therapist. If you eat- <laughs> And you tell people to eat conventional meat, you are torturing animals, you're destroying the soil, you're eating the planet we live on, and you're a bad person. Get a therapist. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay. You now, have a strong opinion about that. It's obvious. And I can tell you the science too. And what's going on there is when you feed these animals the kind of conventional stuff we feed them that's full of glyphosate, well, you're getting glyphosate. When you feed them antibiotics, antibiotics some of them are xenoestrogens and it changes the gut bacteria. Oh, by the way, it changes the bacteria on our planet. And it makes all of us less healthy when you eat that because they're spraying manure full of antibiotics and bad bacteria that are aggressive and they're putting in our water system. It's becoming a part of our planet. Not okay. It shouldn't take a paleo blogger to tell you that. Okay, this is a human, the, you know, the bubble that we're all in for yeah. coronavirus. It's called the earth. Don't do that. It's yeah. not okay. Okay. Yeah. Now we get into the fatty acids and Rob's argument is that, oh, some of the fatty acids um, in there, oh, there isn't that big of a difference, et cetera, et cetera, except it's what's not in there that's important. When you eat conventionally raised cows, there's this great mold toxin. And I write a lot about mold toxins because they will cause cravings. If you eat, if you drink moldy coffee, you live in a moldy house, you can't eat enough. You'll just be hungry all the time. Yes. And what they do is they distill a mold toxin called xeralinone. It's a xenoestrogen, a thousand times more potent than estrogen. Okay, it's gonna give you man boobs and it's going to make you delicious by making stripes of fat throughout all of your muscle. And women don't need a thousand times stronger estrogen either, neither do men, no. none of us need that. So they distill it, they make a waxy pellet called xeranol and they put it in the cow's ear and it dissolves through the tympanic membrane, gets into the bloodstream and the cow gets fat on 30% less food. Interesting. Okay, and then you eat the cow, and then you become a cow. So yeah. no, don't eat that stuff. They tortured the animal, they destroyed soil. Proper cows eat grass, and then they poop on the ground and the soil gets thicker. Yes. Okay, I am a small farmer, I do this on my farm. You can see where the pigs and the sheep were. I don't have cows because they eat too much. But um, you can see the plants grow and they thrive. And right next to them on the other side of the fence, the plants are okay. They're part of the ecosystem. So it, they're necessary. And, and to say, just eat conventional stuff, that is to say that you don't care about the long-term effects of the world that you're going to have to live in yeah. if the conventional meat doesn't kill you, which it won't. Just yeah. don't eat it though, because you're going to get mold toxins, antibiotics, bad fats to a certain extent, and you're destroying the environment. Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I find that what happens to people, especially in this era of social media, they're, they're just devouring all this information and then they get really confused. Yeah. And then it once they're confusing. confused, they're like, forget it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this anymore. So one of the things I loved about your book is that you keep, you keep saying like emphasizing flexibility and figure out what's right for you. And you have the different stages of fasting and um, it's just brilliant because I would love to see our world get away from one size fits all. 
and really go Thank into you. what feels right for you. And especially for women, as we start to go through menopause, you, you talk about your wife and how she has to fast differently. I just think this has to be a message that gets out to the world. It, it's a thing where one size fits all doesn't work for diets. It doesn't work for fasting, but there are core principles. Don't eat stuff that makes you hungry. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's so a good principle for all of us. <laughs> you shouldn't be hungry after yeah. you eat. That's a, that is a key principle that most people don't know. Yeah. And I remember my daughter, she was maybe in second grade and she comes home, she goes, daddy, as soon as we get to school, the teacher tells us we have to have a snack. Yeah. She's like, I'm not hungry. Don't the other kids have breakfast? And then I said, well, ask your friends what they eat. And she says, well, my friend Susie, I make up the name. She has a green apple for breakfast. Her mom's a vegan. And, <laughs> and I'm like, well, no wonder she's hungry. Poor kid can't pay attention in school. But my daughter's like, can I pretend to eat? Because I'm really not hungry until lunch. I just don't Beautiful. want food. That means you ate breakfast. And what does she have for breakfast? She has smoked salmon and avocado. They have protein and fat for breakfast. And on rare occasions, some kind of carbs, usually slower, uh, slower metabolizing carbs, some rice or whatever. But generally, no. Do my kids fast? No. Do they skip breakfast if they want to? Actually, I guess that means they're intermittent fasting. And my son, who was 10, said, Daddy, I want to feel what it's like. I'm going to fast for 24 hours. And I'm not going to use any of the hacks because he wanted to. I didn't encourage him to. And I actually told him, you should try a hack. No, no. And he said, I'm going to show I can do it. And when he was done, he said, you're right. Fasting is the best spice ever because that food I ate when I was done fasting was the best food I ever had. And he's never tried fasting again. He just wanted to do it, right? Yeah. This is natural. Yes. Talk a little bit about that because that is also a key is that it resets and the research that I've seen is that it can actually reset your dopamine receptor sites when you fast. Just And it's like the dopamine fasting from our phone, but it's even more powerful because it's food and you're eating it every day. When you take it out, you actually create a physiological dopamine change in your brain. The, the rece you can think of a receptor as like a, a little mouth right? And, and it'll, it'll open a little bit wider because it's like, I'm hungry now. Mm -hmm. And that means it, it will be able to attach to dopamine more easily. And you can train your hemoglobin to actually do the same thing with oxygen by just for very brief periods of time. It's the same concept as fasting, but brief periods of time, you do special breathing exercises or use equipment that, that I use at Upgrade Labs, where you create a hypoxic environment for a minute or two. And the body's like, oh my God, but when you're done, your cells are ready to take in oxygen and then they change their state. So if you do that on an occasional basis, you have more power. And so I think when you fast occasionally, when you do eat, you do use the food better and the neurotransmitters that come from it change. But there's something else that gets reset that is not well known in the fasting community. And I think it's really important because you have such a big dedicated community here. And this has to do with, uh, with ghrelin. And this is why when I weighed 300 pounds and I say I lost 100 pounds, I'm actually lying because I probably lost 200 pounds because I lost 25 pounds, you gain 35. You lose 35, you gain 45. You lose 30, you gain 30. Like, yes, I only gained 30. I lost five pounds. Woohoo. Anyone who's had weight to lose, like serious weight to lose has experienced this. And some of it, yeah, you can lose water weight. You know, it goes up and down with your monthly cycle or with how many carbs you have. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about real fat. It, goes, it comes and it goes. The reason for this is that you have a hunger set point. And it will be set by ghrelin based on your body weight. So in a weight, 300 pounds, I had a 300 pounds hunger levels. And then if you fast by, not fast, if you lose weight by, lose, by just eating less calories and exercising more the way that they tell you to do because they're mean people, <laughs> what you end up with is, let's say you get down to 250 pounds, I lost 50 pounds. And every day you're like, man, those cookies look good, but I'm going to muscle through this. I'm just not going to do it. Right? And eventually it comes back. Well, what's happening there is that your hunger set point stayed where it was. Guess what resets your ghrelin sensitivity to your current body weight? Fat. Ketones. Ketones. So okay. as soon as you fast for a day or two, or as soon as you get your ketone levels up, magically now your body says, oh, let's make the hunger match your actual body weight instead of making Beautiful. your thin hunger equal your fat body weight. Amazing. It's, like everyone who loses weight, even if you lose it on some dumb diet, like fast for a couple of days afterwards to get your ketone levels up. So at least then when you're done fasting, you'll be as hungry as you should be instead of as hungry as your fat self. How and long like, do you how long do you think you have to do that for? Because I know we'll get that question. It's like, well, is that a day? Is it three days? How long will it reset my my levels? Oh, it'll reset it permanently. 
until you start eating, until you gain weight for other reasons, and then your your ghrelin levels will match your body weight. And but yeah. if you regularly participate in fasting or regularly add something, I don't know, to your coffee that raises your ketone levels, then your fat set point will like, oh, how are you today? Let's make your hunger match your current body weight, so you don't Beautiful. deal with hunger. So part of fasting is willpower to overcome hunger. Okay, that's expensive. Willpower takes electrons and it takes effort. Okay. Mm. If you set your biology up right, then it's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do something hard because I'm going to do a spiritual fast. I'm going to become you know, one with myself. I'm going to feel my feelings. And I so encourage people to do that. But the rest of the time, for God's sake, like, how about you just don't get distracted by hunger? Because I found this study, 15, up to 50%, but 15% minimum thoughts that most people have during the day are about what's for their next meal. Really? Yeah. And there's an actual study reference in Fast This Way. So- what if you got 15% of your thoughts back every day to think about anything on earth except for food? You can think about being a better parent, starting your next company. I don't know. I'm, I have my podcast and books and I'm CEO of several companies and I couldn't do all that and be a dad and a husband and a farmer if I was thinking about food all the time. So yeah. you get that back when you, when you choose to fast. It is really powerful. So, so one of the things that really struck out to me in your book, and I'm hearing it in you right now, is that you feel like when people come over to this fasting lifestyle, it doesn't have to be hard. And that no. uh, like one of the things I've been witnessing is that there's a hard period, but once you adapt and the body figures out what it's doing, it seems to click in. And because we're designed this way, fasting gets easier and easier over time. But what I hear from you is you get the coffee with the MCT oil and the butter and the soluble fiber and you lean on that in the beginning and maybe yeah. you keep leaning on that and the hard goes away. It might take you probably 60, maybe 90 days, depending on your health status, how much weight you have to lose and all that, to start having a flexible metabolism that's like, oh, I always have ketones present. And the trick for me anyway is when I do eat carbs, I pour some MCT oil on them. So there's always 0 0.2, 0 0.3 ketones in my body. So my cells are like, oh yeah, ketones are a regular source of energy in my diet. MCT oil can't be stored as fat. It's metabolized almost like a carb, but it doesn't raise blood sugar. So if you do that regularly, but it's like, oh, I should always be ready to go into ketosis and I should always be ready uh, to eat carbs, right? Because you eat carbs a couple nights a week or three nights a week, or a lot of women, this is going to sound amazing. They fast in the morning and they have carbs at dinner every night and they're not yep. bad people. Oh my goodness, who would have ever thought? <laughs> that's, well, that's actually what I've been teaching a, a lot is that you got to fast, do your fast. And then when you eat, you got to eat. We can't like be in restriction. And for women, we need to be eating more foods that build up our progesterone, especially yes. as we go through menopause. Yes. So to talk a little bit, finish up on that because the, my community is largely, largely women. And I really want to, women to understand that you can fast and you can eat too. And they're both healing states for us. Um, they really are healing states. And pardon me for one second. I am yep. going to... Um, but my other person now, uh, coming soon. All right. Ask me that question one more time. If you would, okay. I get distracted by yeah, no worries no, uh, for women. I love that you included that women need to do it different. But what, one of the things I'm trying to teach women to do is that it's okay to eat. It's okay yeah. to fast. It's okay to eat. And we can have both of those states in a 24 hour period and they will both benefit you. If you don't eat, uh, over time, there's, uh, there's a word for that. It's starvation, yeah. right? And you don't need to do that. And one of the things that I would encourage men and women to do is understand something. When you see the, the Hollywood star and, and they've got these you know, ripped abs and, and whether it's a woman or a man, ripped abs and like lean stringy muscle, the way they do that is they fast for a day or two before the shirt's off or that shoot. They take diuretics to drop all of the water out of the body and they feel like crap and they look that way for the shot and then they go and they usually eat a bunch of cheeseburgers. Okay, that is not how healthy people look. It has never been how healthy people look and it is especially not how healthy women look. 
What your body does if you're in your fertile years is it's storing your omega-3s, especially DHA, on your butt and on your hips. And your first baby is going to benefit from that the most if you choose to have kids. And it's supposed to be there. And if the body is getting a signal from the environment that there isn't enough food or enough healthy fat to do that, it will mess with your hormones because it doesn't want you to get pregnant because there's a famine, which means you could die, which means your stress hormones will be high. So you got to give it enough food and enough nutrients with enough regularity to send the signal that says you are safe. Because if you're like most animals, there's a pretty good chance you're going to get pregnant. Even if you're not planning to, your body doesn't know you're not planning to. And it feels unsafe if you are on such a low calorie or such a low energy density or just low nutrient diet or you're fasting all the time. It's like, man, this is not a time. So let me actually turn this off. And I've interviewed athletes, uh, female athletes, we're like, oh, it was great. I went into ketosis. I won an event and I didn't have to deal with my period for a year. I'm like, do you know what you're doing to your biology? Right. Ah, don't do that. Not if yes. you want to live a long time. Yes. Right? Agreed. So absolutely agree. Like you're, you're, you're sending a signal from the environment into your body that says, look, there, we, I'm, in a, I'm in a place of abundance. It doesn't mean I always have abundance, but it means I never starve so much that I'm starting to break myself down in a way that's unhealthy. Yeah. And so look, you look at the food and you say, is this food going to serve me? And if so, you eat it. And if you say, you know, that food is going to taste really good, but I know I'm going to be hungry and have a hangover afterwards. It's not going to serve me. Over time, you start to look at something like a McNugget and you stop seeing it as food. Like that actually isn't what works for me. It's not compatible. I I can't put this battery in this device because they don't fit. Mm. So that will happen. And it's going to take you about five years. But the question is, will this food serve me? And it serves you by providing energy and providing nutrition and by being free of stuff that messes with you. And that's why don't do the conventional meat. It's full of stuff that messes with you. Don't do vegetables that cause inflammation. They mess with you. And not all vegetables mess with everyone the same way, but there's general rules and algorithms to follow for that. And I I share that stuff in, in Fast This Way because it's how you think about food and how you tell yourself that you're safe when you go without. You can go without companionship. I was afraid of loneliness, so I fasted in a cave for four days to show myself I'm not going to die if I'm alone. I'm actually going to have to feel my feelings, think about my thoughts and all that. Right, And you're going to be able to sit at a table and people are eating. Their, their mirror neurons, are gonna, they're going to see you and they're going to feel hungry for you. And you send them love. And, and you're like, look, as I'm fasting right now, it's not because I have an eating disorder. I'm fasting right now because it makes me feel good and I'm going to have a very healthy meal tomorrow. And it's just okay. But if you're not okay with that, you've got to do your inner work. And a big part of fast this way is the inner work, not the biology of fasting. We understand that guys like skip a meal every now and then it's good for you. There, there's a whole book on fasting. (laughs) I love it. Okay, last thing. I want to finish up with five rapid fire questions for you. This has been great. And I really appreciate you taking the time. And my community is just going to, it's going to devour this information because you brought a whole new slant to fasting. Okay, what you have an amazing podcast. You've been doing it, I don't know, 20, 30 years. No. <laughs> yeah, before podcasts were invented, me and Al Gore invented it. Right. Now. Okay, who's the this year? Let's start with this year. What, who's the most interesting person you've interviewed and why? Oh man, this year. It's been a long year. Right? Wow, we've had like 40 something guests and I don't remember dates very well. Uh, so I'm going to go probably really recently. Um, I interviewed someone named uh, Lisa Wimberger, who talked about neurosculpting and how there's meditation techniques to turn on specific parts of the brain in specific orders so that people who oftentimes have a hard time with meditation are able to meditate. And it's tied directly to the vagal nerve, which is something that's heavily influenced by what you eat and when you eat. So I think that there's going to be a lot of awareness now about how, hey, if you're already fasting, maybe a meditation that chills you out even more isn't what you need. Maybe you need a meditation to wake up a little bit. And we've kind of, meditation to put you to sleep, maybe it's not what you need. So that that was a fascinating interview. And certainly I've had interviews with um, so many amazing people, including uh, Dr. Fung. Uh, I think I've got his his new yeah. book here, The Cancer Code. That was a, also one of my favorite interviews. Like, hey, this is the book for cancer. Just read this book. It's got what you need. So, man, awesome. uh, picking one's hard. Yeah. Okay. What right now we're in this crazy pandemic. If you, we have a lot of people influencing where where this pandemic is heading. If you could talk to any of those influencers and uh, really help them see a different way, who would that be, and what would you say? Well, 
I think I've already talked to him. Uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy was on Bulletproof Radio, and Biden named him as co-chair of the Coronavirus Task Force. He was a former U.S. Surgeon General, and we connected so well. And the reason I had him on my show was he hadn't been named yet, but he wrote a book after his time as Surgeon General about an epidemic. And the epidemic that he wrote about was about connection and the lack of connection. And he said it's causing, it's costing more, it's causing more pain, causing more, more problems than anything else. And if we could just get people reconnected to each other, most of our problems would go away. Mm. And to hear that message uh, and to be able to say, wow, we've got a guy who, who knows the cost of disconnectedness, who's now setting coronavirus policy going forward. I'm pretty excited because he's a good human being who cares about that side of it. Um, the, awesome. other, the other thing I would say is focus on your inner mask. Your inner mask happens, it's called your immune system, your metabolism. Don't eat fried stuff, take your vitamin D, take your zinc and live your life. Yes, awesome, I love it. Okay, what's the biggest failure you've had and what did you learn from it? Oh God, I've had so many failures, the biggest one. One of the, the big ones happened when I was 26. I was in Silicon Valley, I made $6 million when I was 26 years old, it was awesome. Wow. Lost it when I was 28, it was not awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so bet. what I learned from it, this is going to sound like such a douchey thing to say. I looked at a friend at the company who'd also made stupid amounts of money. And I said, I'll be happy when I make 10 million. So what I learned is that money doesn't make you happy. I was just going to say, that's the lesson you learned from losing it. Yes. Yep. I wasn't yeah. happy when I had it. So you don't get happy. You don't get happy from getting things. Yeah. You get happy from serving people. Yeah, agreed. Okay, last question. If you had one message for the world that you could just implant in everybody's brain, what would that message be? It would be something that I share oftentimes with entrepreneurs, but I'll share it with everyone. It's, it's that people want to help. I talked about those three F words in our interview earlier, fear, food, your favorite one. Um, <laughs> You're going to make me say it again. Huh? <laughs> fertility. <laughs> and there is a fourth one. And the first three are actually kind of tied to, to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, but before he died, Maslow didn't publish his next part of the hierarchy. And I interviewed uh, someone recently who studied everything Maslow ever wrote. He was about to publish something that said the final thing on the hierarchy of needs is transcendence. Mm. Uh, and this ties into the fourth F word. After you do those other things, all life forms have friend. So bacteria work together to make yogurt or biofilms and trees make a forest and people make tribes and we make community and we are wired to do that. And the implication for that, the advice for everyone would be people want to help you. If only you will ask them and be willing to receive the help. The world is full of people who want to help. You just don't see it. Amazing. I love that. Well, we're going to help you by doing a book study on Fast This Way. So oh, thank you. I, I, really, I, I really appreciate the book. I appreciate you taking the time. And you're just, you are a icon in the health influencing world. So thank you. This has been really delightful and keep changing the world. Appreciate it. The third thing the mitochondria do, so we have fear, we have food, and what else does all life have to do, Mindy, in order to stay alive? It's also an F word. It has to, uh, I was going to say, it has to procreate. That's not an F word. <laughs> it has to fuck. Oh my God. I was talking fertility. Oh. Oh, you're going to make me blush. <laughs>